Hi everyone, welcome to Chalk Talk Med, where I cover high yield medicine topics for students. In this video, we're going to be talking about a special type of necrosis known as liquefactive necrosis. Here's a look at our outline. We're going to start with an overview of cell death to see where liquefactive necrosis fits in. Then we're going to talk about the mechanism and causes of liquefactive necrosis, and there are three main causes, bacterial abscesses, CNS ischemia, and acute pancreatitis, and we're going to go through them in that order, and then we're going to wrap up the video with one final factoid. All right, let's get started. All right, so we're going to be learning about liquefactive necrosis, which is a type of cell death. So let's start with an overview of cell death. So this can occur by a bunch of different mechanisms. The main two we're interested in learning about are apoptosis and necrosis. And these two are basically the opposite of each other in many different ways. And if you want to learn more about their differences, check out this video right here. Now, apoptosis can occur by intrinsic pathway versus the extrinsic pathway. And necrosis, on the other hand, has six different types. And each of these uh, types reflects a different uh, underlying tissue morphology of the necrotic tissue. And the one that we're going to focus on today is liquefactive necrosis. Okay, so now we can get into necrosis. Here are the six different tissue types. And there's a couple of things I want to mention here. Number one is the name. So I was always wondering where these names come from, and it's actually just describing the tissue. So coagulative necrosis, just describing that the tissue is coagulated, that means it's congealed, thick and gooey. Liquefactive just means the tissue is liquefied and soft and watery, so they're totally opposite of each other, and so on and so forth for the rest of them. So that's all these names are, and they can actually be very helpful in helping you remember what the tissue looks like. Second important little factoid here is that number one and two, coag and liquefactive, are the two most common necrotic tissue types. And uh, exam questions really like you to be able to tell the difference between them. So when it comes to compare and contrast, make sure you really focus in on knowing the difference between these. And then finally, for each of these types of necrosis, they have their own unique diseases that cause them and the pathophysiology and what the tissue looks like. So as you watch the videos that cover each of these, those are the things to really pay attention to, um, to be able to focus on learning and be able to distinguish them from each other. All right, so now let's get into liquefactive necrosis and talk about its cause and mechanisms. So the main underlying problem with liquefactive necrosis is the release of digestive enzymes. So these are released by cells and they end up digesting the tissue. And there's a very easy hint in that digestion causes breakdown of solids into liquids, AKA liquefaction causing liquefactive necrosis. So the point here is that this tissue digestion by these digestive enzymes causes formation of liquids from solids. And that's why it's called liquefactive necrosis. So the next question is why would there be digestive enzymes being released and there are in fact three main conditions that cause liquefactive necrosis by releasing these digestive enzymes and they're listed here so what we're going to do in the next few slides is we're going to go through each of these and describe the mechanisms starting with bacterial abscess all right so let's start with bacterial infections that are purulent meaning that they cause formation of pus and turn into abscesses so generally when bacteria invade our body the main white blood cells that respond to fight them are neutrophils. These guys are phagocytes that can also release their lysosomal enzymes and kill the bacteria. Now this is great in getting rid of the bacteria. The problem is that these lysosomal enzymes are hydrolytic and therefore they can be toxic. So what happens in this situation is that you have a significant bacterial invasion, typically by a bacteria such as Staph aureus or MRSA. And so you have all these neutrophils that are gonna to respond to this bacterial invasion. So you have this overwhelming release of all of these hydrolytic lysosomal enzymes. And what this is gonna do is it's not only gonna kill the bacteria, but it's also gonna cause damage to the uh, rest of the cells and the tissue as innocent bystanders. Standards. So this is going to lead to digestion of all of that surrounding tissue and as it gets digested it turns into soft uh, liquefied tissue and this is the liquefaction that happens as a re result of these hydrolytic lysosomal enzymes that were released by the neutrophils. Now, as a consequence of all of this, you're going to have a bunch of uh, fluid collection, and this liquid is going to contain um, dead bacteria and dead cells, and this is going to have sort of a creamy colored appearance, and this is what leads to the formation of pus, which you see right here. So this is a typical clinical picture of an abscess. So usually at the center of the abscess, you have this area of purulent discharge, which is this creamy stuff right here. This contains pus, which is uh, cell and bacterial debris, and there's all of the surrounding signs of inflammation. You have the rubble color dolor all that stuff right here so this is indicating that there's a bacterial infection and inflammation with formation of pus which is an abscess due to liquefactive necrosis of that bacteria and there's a pretty cool clinical pearl here when you do your ed or surgery rotation one of the things that you're going to hear is that the treatment of an abscess should not be giving antibiotics alone because they're not going to work and now you can kind of know why that is because at the center of this abscess, it is not really living bacteria. It's a bunch of dead bacteria and cellular debris. So giving antibiotics 
whose function is to kill bacteria isn't going to make these dead bacteria any more dead, so it's not going to be very effective. So the main treatment for an abscess is going to be an incision and drainage, so you actually have to uh, lance this open and drain all of this pus and get rid of the period fluid that contains all of this debris. All right, now let's move on to disease number two that can cause liquid factor necrosis, which is CNS ischemia or infarct. So CNS is the central nervous system, and it technically includes both the spinal cord and the brain, and liquid factor necrosis can occur in both. But almost always when we're talking about this kind of ischemia and infarct, we're talking about the brain, and essentially what we're talking about is something known as an ischemic stroke. And as just as a quick reminder, ischemia means decreased blood flow, and infarct is talking about the dead tissue that is a consequence of decreased blood flow, which is ischemia. So here, we're essentially talking about them as the same thing. So the problem here is decreased blood flow to the brain, aka ischemic stroke. When that happens, that causes liquefactive necrosis. And this is very different um, and an important exception because essentially in the body, all other causes of ischemia lead to coagulative necrosis. And this is a very high yield distinction to know. The brain is unique in many ways, including in this way, in that its ischemia causes liquefactive necrosis. So let's see how this happens. So in ischemic stroke, you have decreased blood flow to the brain. Therefore, those neurons are going to get injured. And as a consequence, white blood cells are going to respond to this area of injury. And there's going to be release of lysosomal enzymes, both from the white blood cells that are responding, as well as the neurons that are dying. And all of these lysosomal enzymes now are free in the environment to digest the brain tissue. And this process is going to actually take several days. But as this digestion occurs, the brain tissue starts to slowly get essentially chewed away or digested away. And over time, this is going to lead to the formation of a cavity or an empty space. And uh, this empty space over time is going to get replaced by cerebral spinal fluid because inside of the brain, um, you have uh, inside of the skull, the brain is surrounded by this fluid known as CSF. So the necrotic tissue in that area is going to replace, be replaced by cerebral spinal fluid. And surrounding this cavity, you're going to have formation of a protective scar. And this is going to be lined by glial cells. Now, glial cells are the helper cells of the nervous system that support the neurons. So when you study the nervous system, you learn that there are two types of cells. There are the neurons that are the actual functional cells, and then there are the glial cells that are the helper cells. So you have specialized glial cells known as astrocytes. They're the most abundant type of glial cells, and they have these projections that make them star-shaped. That's why they're called astrocytes. And their main job is to provide physical support. So what's going to happen here is, as shown in this picture right here, you have an area of ischemic necrosis that has occurred and this is a CT scan of a, patient, a patient's brain several months later. So this is the area where the stroke had occurred, and you can see that there's a huge cystic cavity missing brain right here that was digested away. So that's a consequence of liquefactive necrosis, and it has been replaced by cerebral spinal fluid. So that's what all of this dark gray is right here. And surrounding it, so lining up the walls right here, is formation of this glial scar formed by astrocytes, which are these specialized helper cells. And the formation of this um, cystic cavity lined by glial cells um, is a very important feature of liquefactive necrosis in the brain that you should be aware of. All right, so let's talk about our final cause of liquefactive necrosis, which is pancreatitis. And as you can tell from the name, this is inflammation of the pancreas. So pancreas is an important organ. It's in the upper abdomen, and it contains these digestive enzymes that break down proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates, and it secretes them into the lumen of the small intestines where they can break down the macromolecules from our diet and help us digest them. So if the pancreas contains all of these very potent digestive enzymes, why doesn't it uh, constantly break down its own tissue that's made up of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins? And the reason is because under normal circumstances, these enzymes are in their inactive form, so they're known as zymogens. So while they're still in the pancreas, they're inactive. Once they get secreted and enter the lumen of the small intestines, they become activated and they can chop up proteins, macromolecules, carbohydrates, and take care of business. So this is an important checkpoint, but it's lost during pancreatitis. So here's what happens in pancreatitis. Step one is you have pancreatic cell injury, for example, from toxic effects of ethanol. And now this irritated cell is going to cause premature activation of those digestive enzymes. One important example is trypsinogen. So this trypsinogen, which is the zymogen, is going to be prematurely activated to trypsin, which is the active form, while still within the pancreatic cells. And then these um, digestive enzymes such as trypsin are going to be released from the cells in their active form within the pancreas. Therefore, they're going to lead to autodigestion of the pancreas and this uh, liquefaction, which is going to lead to liquefactive necrosis, causing um, the findings of pancreatitis and liquefactive necrosis. Now, one additional high yield thing to know about pancreatitis 
is that in addition to this liquefactive necrosis that we just learned the mechanism of right here, pancreatitis can also cause a different type of necrosis known as fat necrosis. So if you want to learn about the mechanism of that, you can check out this video on fat necrosis to learn more. But the point at this time is pancreatitis is unique because it can cause two types of necrosis, liquefactive necrosis and fat necrosis. All right, so let's wrap up this video by learning about one little important factoid to distinguish coagulative from liquefactive necrosis, and that has to do with caustic injury, and this is a pretty high-yield little uh, fact to keep in mind. So caustic injury is chemical burns, and this happens when either the skin or the mucous membranes come into contact with an acid or a base, or when an acid or a base is ingested, and this can cause caustic injury to the GI tract. So either way, if the um, caustic chemical is an acid, this is going to lead to coagulative necrosis, and that's because this acid is going to lead to the denaturation of proteins, which is going to lead to all the subsequent steps that cause coagulative necrosis. On the other hand, if it is a base, this is going to liquefy and solubilize all the proteins. So this is going to liquefy the tissue and lead to liquefactive necrosis. So this distinction is very important to keep in mind. Caustic injury by acid, coagulative necrosis, caustic injury by base, liquefactive necrosis. All right, so let's wrap up with a 60-second summary. So in liquefactive necrosis, the necrotic tissue is liquefied. That means that the tissue structure is digested and it is not preserved, which is what you would see in coagulative necrosis. So this is a major distinction between the two. There are three main causes, bacterial abscesses, CNS ischemia, and pancreatitis. The underlying mechanism for all of them is digestive enzymes, a couple of important findings are in a bacterial abscess, you're going to have formation of creamy liquid pus, and this is going to contain cells and bacterial debris, and these are a consequence of the necrosis. In brain ischemia, uh, over a period of several months, you're going to have formation of a cavity inside the skull where the necrotic tissue has been uh, replaced and filled by cerebral spinal fluid, and this is going to be aligned by a scar that's going to be formed by those astroglial cells. And finally, as a consequence of caustic injury, uh, the type of chemical that causes liquefactive necrosis are bases, aka alkali. All right, that's it and that's all. If you enjoyed this video, you wanna learn more about this topic, uh, check out these related videos that I've linked here. Uh, you can also search our channel, Chalk Talk Med, for other topics to see if they're covered. And finally, if there are other videos that you wanna see or you just wanna give some feedback, please uh, feel free to drop your thoughts in the comment section. But thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.